tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about riverine rabbits and fatal fairs. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Yul Nope and the Vesper's Bell are voice talents Nate Dufort, Nick Goroff, Steve Gray, Alicia Pavlis, Olivia Steele, and Jeff Sturdivant. Now... Get your ticket ready, take your seat in our Theater of the Minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Yul Nope and is performed by Nate Dufort. After a particularly successful hunt and a delicious rabbit stew, a man is being stalked by what looks like a pair of rabbit ears jutting out from various places he goes by throughout the day. He becomes increasingly paranoid as they start to pop up more frequently, and he doesn't know what to do. Now, without further ado, I present to you Rabbit Ears. I was looking through the rearview mirror when I first saw them. Something in their reflection stuck out from behind a truck on the other side of the parking lot. They ducked down as if they realized they'd been spotted. I knew it was probably just my imagination, so I ignited the keys. The rabbit's foot from my last successful hunting trip hung on the end of the keychain. I smiled, thinking about how good the rabbit tasted as I drove off. The next time it happened, I got a better look. I was driving past the funeral home that was on the route I took to work. The lot outside was normally empty, but a full procession was parked today. There, on the opposite side of the hearse, was them again. Upon closer inspection, there were two chalky stalks, side by side, that looked like a massive pair of rabbit ears. Again. They ducked down once they were spotted. The people talking out front of the home gave me a weird look as I drove by. By the time I looked to the other side of the hearse, they'd vanished yet again. I wish that were the last time I saw them, but it wasn't. I was walking to the restaurant I normally went to for lunch when I felt something off. I looked across the road and there they were again sticking out of the alley behind the weathered red brick of an abandoned building. I stopped in my tracks, debating whether or not to approach them. My curiosity won out, and I crossed the street. 
I could see the ears slowly backing away behind the wall, and they were completely gone by the time I approached the alley. And what scared me the most was that it started to get bolder. The first few times, it ducked away quickly. The next few, it did vanish, but slower. Eventually, the ears remained glued to whatever hiding spot they had, no longer caring if I noticed them. They started popping up all over the place. I saw them behind billboard signs on the highway. They easily stuck out in the empty fields I drove by. I even saw them sticking up behind the small, innocent green shrub I passed by daily. Without picturing those ears following me, I couldn't even think of the excellent rabbit stew I made that one time. I arrived home to my little two-story log cabin one day, paranoid because I hadn't seen them all day. They'd never really appeared close to my house, but I needed to be sure. I crept around, looking for any sign of the pasty white stalks. I checked the corners, the shadows behind the doors. There was no sign of them. I was somewhat relieved, but still panicking. I went to my bedroom to at least attempt to sleep. Right outside my bedroom window were the ears, illuminated by the moonlight. The ears disappeared as I darted up. I double-checked that all the doors were locked. I bolted the windows shut and drew the curtains back. I grabbed my rifle, stuffed it full of ammo, and tucked more rounds into my pocket. I inspected every inch of the house, my finger shaking on the trigger. The only noise was the sound of my own harsh breathing. There was no sign of the ears anywhere. The shadows in the corners were empty. Nothing was sitting on the furniture in the living room or the closets. After making sure the second floor was clear, I returned to the room and sat on the bed. The gun pointed at the window. I looked at my keys on the nightstand and realized that the rabbit's foot was curled unnaturally upright. When I heard a loud creak, I accidentally squeezed the trigger and a bullet went right through my window. After the ringing in my ears died down a little, they perked up at the sound of a light thumping coming from inside my house. I could hear it on the first floor before whatever it was going up the stairs. It got louder before I could hear it thumping right above me. Some of the paint on top of the ceiling chipped away. There was a brief pause before it started again and came bounding back down the stairs. Eventually, I could hear it right outside the bedroom door. Before I could react, the ears slowly started revealing themselves from behind the door. I heard a noise that sounded somewhere between a hiss and a cackle, and a long, slender hand reached out through the doorway, its overgrown nails digging into the wall. I should have fired at it in hindsight, but my hands were too shaky to land an accurate shot. When I sprung out of the bed, the ears retracted back behind the doorway. The shot went through the wall, missing it completely. I grabbed my keys, cocked the gun, and slowly crept into the hall where they had vanished again. I closed the door behind me and entered the living room. When I heard rattling in the corner, I fired two more shots. The only thing they hit was my potted plant, its contents spilling out onto the floor. Another shot went through my closet door, but that noise turned out to be an old suitcase I had that was shifting around a bit. One last shot went out my window, but that turned out to be the sound of the crickets outside my cabin. As I reloaded, I could hear the damn thing thumping around on the floor above me. It was hard to slide the bullets in because of how much my hands were shaking. When I eventually got them in, I fired a few rounds into the ceiling, and the bounding stopped. I looked over to the stairs, contemplating whether or not to find out what this thing was that was torturing me. I turned my head back and stared at the front door, but I knew this had to end tonight. Despite my better judgment 
and every sense screaming at me to get the hell out of there. I walked towards the stairs. Weary step by step, I climbed the staircase, clutching the end of the gun tight. As I climbed, I contemplated what I had done to deserve this torment. I'd never wronged anyone, never robbed, stole, or cheated. The only things I'd killed were the animals in the woods, the most recent one being that delicious rabbit. It hit me. The rabbit. The foot curling. Me killing and eating it had pissed off whatever this was. It was out for my blood. Uh, maybe it would cook me in a stew and eat me like I did to his relative. I shook that thought from my head. Now wasn't the time to let my imagination run wild. When I reached the top, I hurried to the spot where I had shot at. There was nothing. No blood. No fur. No sign of the ears at all. That made me wonder why the bounding had stopped and where it had gone to. I could hear the hopping start again in an adjacent room, and I unloaded into the wall where it was. Every last bullet I had went into putting this monster down. The hopping quickly stopped, and I put my ear to the wall. No more sounds were coming from that room. I looked at the door leading to it, my hand shaking as I turned the knob. There was nothing inside. The window was still locked tight. The air vent wasn't tampered with. Except for my gunshots, it looked like nothing had been disturbed. I reached into my pocket for more ammo before realizing I had just wasted it all. I could hear the bounding pick up from under me. It was on the first floor now, blocking my escape. I couldn't do anything but stand there, teary-eyed. I put my hand in my other pocket and had one last idea. I took the rabbit's foot off my keychain and tossed it down the staircase. Whatever you are, I'm sorry I killed it. This is the only thing that's left of him. I know it isn't a lot, but if you let me go, I'll never harm another animal for as long as I live. I swear. I promise. The bounding stopped, and there was pure silence for what felt like hours, followed by a loud crash. Getting the courage to head down the stairs took me a while. When I did, I saw that the foot had been taken, and I saw that the crash had been what used to be my front door, now lying on the ground completely off the hinges. Even if it had taken mercy on me, I still had to get out of there. I couldn't bear being in this house for one more minute. I ran to my car and thrashed the keys out of my pocket. I yanked open the car door, started it, wrenched the gear shift into reverse, and slammed on the accelerator. I didn't stop panicking until I reached the highway. By then, the first glimpse of the morning sun had taken over the black shroud of the sky. Although it didn't completely soothe my paranoia, the daytime was somewhat comforting. I looked over at the driver next to me. It felt like a huge weight was lifted off of my shoulders. I sighed with relief at the fact that I wouldn't have to spend my days looking out for those damned white stalks. I could finally go back to living a normal life, just like him and everyone else I was driving past. I realized my rearview mirror was a little crooked, so I adjusted it. When I did, I saw a pair of rabbit ears poking out from my back seat. I hope you enjoyed Rabbit Ears, as written by Yul Nope and performed by Nate Dufort. Nate Dufort is a writer, producer, director, and voice actor who splits his time between Detroit and Chicago. 
He also performs over on the Creepy Podcast, which you can hear by going to www.creepypod.com. We're so thankful to have him share his talent with us. Our second tale of the evening is written by the Vespers Bell and is performed by Nick Goroff, Steve Gray, Alicia Pavlis, Olivia Steele, and Jeff Sturdivant. In it, we get a first-class ticket to a terrifying train ride. And without any further ado, I present to you Trolley Problems. I stumbled out of an unlit hallway, recalling nothing of how I arrived there, just as I had countless times before. As always, my most recent memory was of my last ride on the trolley, vivid enough that a lingering phantom agony still pervaded my once again whole and healthy body. The old trolley station was now depressingly familiar to me. It was made almost entirely from mottled grey bricks, unevenly eroded by the slow trickle of leaking, fetid sewer water along the surface. Harsh yet faint and incandescent bulbs caged against the walls and ceiling provided the only source of illumination other than the garish backlight of an automated drink dispenser, our only source of sustenance, should we desire any. At the edge of the rusted tracks was a single iron bench, the kind they deliberately make uncomfortable so that the homeless won't sleep on it. It was long enough to hold five people, and there were already four upon it. Since I was the last one needed to fill up the bench, I knew that the trolley would be coming soon. I recognized the man nearest to me, a heavy-set and dark-skinned man by the name of Gregory, as we had ridden together before. He was doing his best to remain stoic, but I could tell by the slight tremble of the coffee in his hand that he was dreading the oncoming trolley as much as I was. At the other end of the bench was a disheveled, middle-aged woman quietly sobbing to herself, and next to her was a young woman who seemed more confused than frightened, almost certainly a first-timer. In the middle of the bench sat a preteen girl, with dark black eyes and wavy dark hair pulled back in a half ponytail, wearing a red and white velvet dress, knee high white socks, and shiny buckle up shoes. It wasn't just her age or her well groomed appearance that had set her apart from the rest of us, but the fact that she was happily swinging her legs and sipping at her hot chocolate as she waited for the trolley. She even gave me an enthusiastic wave as I approached the bench. Hey, Max. Good to see you're still keeping it together. Gregory greeted me, raising his coffee cup slightly in a commiserative toast. Ladies, this is Max. I've ridden with him a few times before. Max, this young lady next to me is Sarah, and that there's Desiree. The woman at the end isn't talking, though, and she's got every right not to. We've got a kid with us today might boost our odds of becoming the surviving trolley. On the other hand, we've got a newcomer, and the committee will probably think she needs to pay her dues. Ah, hello there, Sarah. I said to the girl in the softest tone I could, is this your first time here? Nope. I've ridden the trolley lots of times. She replied with an enthusiastic grin. I gave Gregory a bemused and horrified grimace, to which he merely shrugged in response. Uh, hi. I I'm sorry, but I, I still don't understand what the hell is going on here. Desiree interjected. I, I must have gone into the wrong station, but when I tried to go back, I just 
ended up back here. It doesn't make any sense. The only way out of here is on the trolley, I explained to her patiently. Passengers only come in through the hallways, not out. The trolley never comes unless there are enough people to fill the bench, which varies each time. Never miss the trolley. If the trolley leaves and you're not on it, the lights go out and you're stranded here in pitch darkness. Then you'll start hearing things. Whispers at first, but they get louder. They talk about you, but never to you. Not even when they're standing right in front of you. First, they'll talk about how horrible you are and all the terrible things you've done. All your worst sins and secrets. Then they start talking about all the horrible things they'll do to you as punishment once they finally find you. It's such a bizarre and unnatural form of torment that you're sure you must be in hell. Then the lights come back on, and... The older woman broke out into anguished wails, and I couldn't bring myself to finish. I hope I didn't need to finish. Okay, you people are messing with me, right? And this is some kind of uh, hidden camera show or something? Desiree asked in disbelief. They're in the tunnels, too. But at least then you can escape for as long as you can see the light. Gregory added, not bothering to try and debunk her skepticism. And don't think you can get out of riding the trolley by throwing yourself in front of it, either. Trying to take the easy way out will only make it harder on yourself. Sarah warned with an insidious smirk. Before Desiree could ask her to clarify what she meant, we heard the god-awful screeching of the trolley as it pulled itself along its rusty cables and saw its cyclopean incandescent headlight in the gloom of the tunnel. It's here! Trolley's here! Trolley's here! Trolley's here! Trolley's here! Sarah screamed, excitedly bouncing up and down on the bench. Sparks flew off both the overhead cables and the tracks as the trolley screeched itself to a stop in front of us, its flaking crimson paint hardly distinguishable from the rust underneath. The number five was just barely legible on its side. The door slid open, and the woman at the end of the bench immediately raced through them, and the giggling young girl skipped along after her. With a heavy sigh, Gregory rose from the bench and trudged along after them. I patted him on the back as I followed, standing in the doorway, as I waited for Desiree. I understand why you're skeptical, and why you wouldn't necessarily want to board a death trap of a trolley with two strange men an obviously disturbed woman and a possibly psychotic little girl. But the trolley really is the only way out of here, I implored her. If you stay, you're going to find out the hard way why none of us would ever risk missing it again. She seemed to deliberate for a moment between the risks of being alone at the station or being trapped on a trolley with us, grudgingly settling on the latter. She hopped onto the trolley, and the instant I stepped out of the doors, they snapped shut. The blood-red interior was in slightly better condition than the exterior, the space above the windows plastered with ads for things I'd never heard of, like Code Nightmare Regent Red Energy Drink, Satin Stag Cigarettes, and Stygian's Classic Pizzeria. Buckle up, and be sure you're able to hold on to something, I advised Desiree, as I sat across the aisle from Gregory. The older woman had curled up into the fetal position at the back, and Sarah had claimed the front for herself. Wait, what? What's gonna happen? Desiree asked, the alarm obvious in her cracking voice. Before I could answer, 
The trolley speaker system crackled to life. Good evening, passengers, and thank you once again for choosing Gronken Express, turning philosophical thought experiments into real-life atrocities for far too long. A soothingly smooth male voice announced in an old-fashioned cadence, exhaling like he was smoking a cigarette. With a loud pneumatic hiss, the trolley began slowly chugging down the track and into the tunnel. For anyone riding Gedanken Express for the first time today, or any of our regulars in need of a refresher, there are ten trolleys on the tracks, each with a varying number of passengers. The conductor explained. Every one of our passengers has had both their Kantian and utilitarian moral value quantified by the infallible experts on our award-winning ethics committee. Issue with your ranking tough cookies. You're not an award winning ethicist now, are you? Actually, I can see we do have an ethicist on tonight's roster. That's part of what makes this so fun. While half the trolleys are controls filled with random people, the other half are filled with passengers deliberately chosen to confound the system. Tonight, for example, I can see the trolley number nine is filled with genetically identical clones of Adolf Hitler but none of whom have any actual history of violence or extremism. Don't ask me where we got them. That's not my department. At multiple junctures along your journey, you'll be required to choose which trolley must be sacrificed to ensure the survival of the others until there's only one trolley left. I can base my decision on each trolley's net moral value, either Kantian or utilitarian, or average moral value, or which individual is most or least deserving of surviving. Or maybe none of the above. Next time, he, he's gonna kill us, isn't he? Desiree demanded. Then he brings us back. Don't ask us how, Gregory explained. We just stumble back onto the trolley platform like it never happened, just so that we can do it all over again. Over and over and over and over again. Sarah cheered, bouncing in her seat as the woman in the back sobbed to herself. We emerged from the tunnel, out of the side of an impossibly tall stone wall, out across a vast wilderness of sharp rocks and ragged gullies far below. We were held aloft solely by a pair of steel cables, strung up by wobbly wooden poles, racing alongside several other trolleys to either side of us. What the hell? Desiree asked as she peered out across the unfamiliar landscape, no doubt at a loss as to where we were or how we had gotten here. Isn't it cool? It's just like we're flying, except if the cable snaps, we'll fall to an instant fiery death. Sarah exclaimed. Hey, can anyone see the Hitler clones? I want to see the Hitler clones. I find it best not to look at the other trolleys, I replied. Though I was speaking more to Desiree than to Sarah. Same. Gregory nodded. Sorry, passengers, but it looks like we've already run into our first trolley problem. The conductor informed us. Seems like there's not enough power for all of us. That's funny. Since it's more of an engineering problem than a moral one, I'm just going to have to ditch the heaviest trolley, or a worth of its occupants be damned. Trolley number seven, you are out. And before anybody there goes fat shaming anyone, it has nothing to do with the passengers. Even completely empty, Seven's just a big old clunker. Nothing but bad luck. Such a tragedy. We heard the distinctive sound of a mechanical lever being pulled. 
and trolley number seven plummeted down to the sinister land below, smashing open upon the murderous rocks. Don't worry, folks. Even if they didn't all die on impact, the local wildlife will make quick work of them. The conductor assured us. And now that they can't hear us, I'll admit that I did pick the trolley with the most fat people to maximize the amount of food the scavengers would get. On a related note, if anyone here familiar with trolley problems is wondering, you can't actually stop a runaway trolley by pushing a fat person in front of it. Believe me, we've tried. We were all thrown back in our seats as the trolleys suddenly shot forward, the cables weaving around rocky outcroppings and other obstacles almost like a roller coaster, a resemblance that only the ever effervescent Sarah seemed to appreciate. Folks, if you'll be so kind as to look out to your right, you'll see the Gadonkin express his pride and joy, our very own euthanasia coaster. The conductor bragged. A 500 meter drop, the tallest in the world, followed by seven progressively smaller inversions, subjects passengers to a full minute of 10 Gs, which invariably proves fatal. It's the ride of a lifetime, if you'll pardon the pun. But there's one little problem. No one's riding it. Why, this is going to be terrible for the economy. I'm afraid one of you is going to have to go for a spin to drum up some business. Since it's a euthanasia coaster, I suppose I should send the trolley with either the lowest quality of life or shortest life expectancy to keep up appearances. But since it's the most humane death on offer tonight, maybe it should go to the trolley that deserves to suffer the least. Decisions, decisions. The euthanasia coaster is awesome. Everyone should get a chance to go on it. Sarah opined. I think the trolley with the fewest people that have already ridden the coaster should be the one to ride it. Passengers, one of you just made a very thoughtful suggestion, and I think I like it. The conductor proclaimed with glee. No one on trolley number four has ever been on the euthanasia coaster before. And there's a first time for everything. Enjoy the ride while it lasts. Another lever was pulled, and trolley number four was diverted to the dazzling and monstrous roller coaster looming on the horizon. No need for the rest of you to feel left out. We've got plenty of chills, thrills, and kills left in store. The conductor promised. If you look straight ahead, you'll see that we're just about to run out of cable. That's okay, because you're all carrying enough momentum to make it across the gap to the tracks on the other side. The bad news is that there are only eight trolleys left, but only seven tracks across the gap. One of you isn't going to make it. Which one should it be now? I could just pick the trolley with the fewest passengers, but if I play that card now, it might just make for harder choices down the line. Yes, yes, I can hear you shouting Hitler trolley. Number three. Hmm, what's it called when you base someone's moral worth solely on their genetic heritage? You know what? For your unabashed bigotry, I'm making an ad hoc deduction to your score. Trolley number three is off the rails. A lever was pulled. And almost immediately, we ran out of cable and were sent arcing through the air. Despite what the conductor had said, there were in fact eight sets of tracks. But number threes had a large metal barrier erected in front of it that read, Out of Order. Trolley number three crashed right into the barrier in a fiery explosion. And that was the last the rest of us saw of it as we sped along down our respective tracks. They also could have just shared a set of rails with one of us, Gregory muttered. That's not really in the spirit of trolley problems. Sarah chastised him. Though I knew the worst was yet to come, I couldn't help but feel a bit relieved that we were on solid ground again. All the remaining trolleys continued chugging along down the winding tracks, which took us into a foreboding-looking pine forest. Oh, don't look now, passengers, but I think we're being followed. The conductor informed us. Despite his warning, we all looked out the rear window and saw a single handcar barreling down the tracks, its two-man team furiously working a pump to catch up with us. Just 
with another pull of a lever. Charlie number eight began to slow. Within seconds, the bandits had boarded it from the rear, and they were still close enough that we could clearly hear each bandit rapidly empty their revolvers into the passengers before they ever had a chance to land a blow themselves. Ah, uh, well, what they say, God made all men, but Samuel Colt made all men equal. The conductor quipped in a tone that implied he thought he was being very profound. At least they didn't die for nothing. Those bandits will sure never catch us now. With them behind us, we can focus on what's ahead of us. Like that railway crossing. Wow, that highway looks pretty busy. Shouldn't the crossing lights have come on by now? Everyone just hold on a minute, please. I need to check something. Well, isn't this just the worst of luck? The railway crossing lights are out. I don't think those motorists are going to see us coming in time. I'm going to have to send one of you ahead into oncoming traffic. One train wreck should be enough to bring traffic to a halt, and the rest of us can just breathe on by. So, who's it gonna be? This is insane. Does anyone ever make it to the end? Desiree asked gaze transfixed on the torrent of vehicles running perpendicular to us, a collision both imminent and unavoidable. There's no way to know. I run into at least one new passenger every few rides, so they're regularly bringing new people on. Gregory replied, without raising his head, his hands gripping the seat in front of him as he braced for the worst. Whether that means they're letting people go or just collecting us like bottle caps, I couldn't tell you. But I've never met anyone who claimed to have made it to the end and got put back on a trolley. So there's that small bit of hope. Passengers, I'm gonna be up front with you. On paper, this is a pretty straightforward trolley problem. And I should just send the trolley with either the fewest people or the lowest net moral value into traffic. The conductor said. The conductor pulled another lever, and trolley number 10 shot ahead of the rest of us. The instant it made it to the highway, it was T-boned by a transport truck and plowed right off the tracks. The car behind the truck slammed on its brakes and caused a multi-vehicle pileup. The truck itself started careening sideways slamming into several other vehicles before skidding to a halt, its massive tank of oil exploding into a raging inferno upon impact. To either side of the tracks, there was nothing but wailing and bloodied bodies trying to claw their way out of flaming and mangled wreckage, but the tracks themselves were now safe for us to cross. So beautiful! Sarah gushed, as she gleefully gawked out of the corners as we rode by, the sanguine firelight reflecting in her wonderstruck eyes. I think that little accident killed more motorists than trolley passengers. I bet they're regretting not taking the trolley now. The conductor mocked them. Hopefully, the next time we put them back on a platform, they'll make better choices. Well, passengers, that's five trolley problems down. Don't let him get your hopes up, Desiree. I've made it to the halfway point more often than not, and I've lost count of how many trolley rides I've been on, I cautioned her. Passengers, I don't want to alarm you, but I've just received a message from the ethics committee. The conductor said in a hushed tone.
The conductor pulled a lever, and trolley number nine exploded, bouncing off the track slightly before capsizing altogether. His bones goes dynamite. I just killed five Hitlers. He boasted. I know, I know. That's a little hypocritical because of what I said earlier. But come on, in what moral dilemma is killing five Hitlers the wrong choice? Besides, kill five Hitlers will look great on my CV. As long as I don't go into too many details. I'm gonna update that now, actually. Have any of you ever tried just breaking the door and jumping out? Desiree demanded, her head rapidly swiveling between all the windows in the hopes of getting some early warning of the next horror we would be facing. It's not easy, unless the trolley problem requires us to go outside, Gregory explained. But even when you do make it out and survive the jump, you never make it long out there. It's not just the trolleys that are unnatural, it's this whole place. Even if you get off the tracks, there's no escape. And if you become a trolley dodger, they'll just put you on the motorway or worse, till there's a spare ticket for you. The only hope is making it to the end of the line. Desiree looked like she wanted to object, but didn't know what to say. The surreal horror of a situation was difficult to process. But I don't fault her one bit for not knowing how to react. If anything, she was doing better than I did my first ride. She turned back towards the front window, a bewildered and terrified expression overtaking her when she saw what was next for us. What the hell is that? She demanded pointing to the shock-finned SS-emblazoned airship hovering in the distance. Yes! Nazi Zeppelin! Nazi Zeppelin! Nazi Zeppelin! We made it to the Nazi Zeppelin! Sarah cheered, balancing in her seat again. Hey, again, passengers. I'm genuinely sorry for this one. I know these trolley problems tend to get a little more absurd the longer they go on for. Ah... Let me just try to read the nonsense the ethics committee gave me for this one. So, the SS Command is not happy that I killed their Hitler clones, despite their refusal to participate in any Nazi atrocities, and now they've come to avenge their loss. Just goes to show that even making the most ethical choices can have negative consequences if they piss off unethical people. The Zeppelin's going to blitzkrieg us as we drive under them. And because when all you have are trolleys, everything looks like a trolley problem. I'm supposed to elevate one of the tracks into a ramp to send one of you flying into it, destroying it, Endenburg style. So, yeah, apparently Heinrich Himmler is on that thing. The memo in front of me doesn't explicitly mention time travel, but I can only assume this is a time-traveling trolley problem. I'm not sure if I'm only supposed to be considering the impact of destroying a trolley or all the ramifications throughout the timeline here. So, I'm legitimately pulling a lever at random this time. No matter what trolley I pick, Himmler goes up in flames. And a one, and a two, and a five, and a six. A lever was pulled. The track in front of the trolley number six rose up on a 45 degree angle. And Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture began playing over the speakers. The trolley went sailing through the air and collided straight with the Zeppelin, causing the hydrogen-filled balloon to ignite and engulf the entire airship in flames. The burning wreck rapidly descended to the ground. Frantic screaming and angry German expletives still audible over the roaring fire and classical music, and we were just able to make it to the other side before it crashed. Oh, the humanity! The conductor lamented theatrically. Okay, despite my reservations about the setup, that was admittedly pretty amazing. It was a good enough spectacle to sacrifice a random trolley for, at any rate. Rot in pieces, Heinrich. Rot in pieces. Wow, four explosions. Two of them pretty big ones. And we got to see the Nazi Zeppelin. This is such a good trolley ride. Sarah gushed. What the hell is the matter with that kid? Desiree whispered to me. Never seen her before, I whispered back. 
But there are worse coping strategies than that, I suppose. All right, passengers, listen closely now. This penultimate trolley problem gets a little complicated. The conductor announced. Three other trolleys on a set of tracks perpendicular to us left their station at precisely 3.43 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Each is transporting live human organs for medical transplantation and is thus traveling at a maximum speed and will not slow down for any reason. The slowest trolley is moving at 73% the speed of the fastest trolley, which is moving at 112% the speed of the middle trolley. The fastest trolley is carrying the organs with the shortest shelf life, and the slowest trolley, the longest. However, the shelf life of the organs does not necessarily correlate with their moral or economic value or that of their intended recipients. We also need to factor in the carbon footprint of each trolley and the potential labor rights violations of the railroad. Desiree screamed. I looked out the front window and saw an enormous Kodiak bear charging down the tracks, growling furiously at us. As we whizzed past, it took a swipe at trolley number one, knocking clean off the tracks. The bear immediately pounced upon it and clawed it open like a tin can, savagely mauling its occupants as they screamed and struggled to escape. Huh. That wasn't a trolley problem, passengers. That was just a random bear attack. The conductor informed us. I guess that no matter how much you try to control for every variable, some things are just outside of anyone's ability to predict or control for. Also, them bears are mighty strong when they're hungry, ain't they? In any event, the loss of trolley number one renders that whole trolley problem moot. So I guess that means it's time to pick a winner. I mean, survivor. We rounded a bend, and in the distance ahead of us, we could see a tunnel built into the side of a mountain. Its entrance obscured by some fallen boulders. There it is, passengers, the way out, the conductor told us. Unfortunately, there's been an avalanche. The first trolley to hit it should be enough to clear the tracks, but it will surely be derailed in the process. It seems cruel that you both should make it within sight of the exit, but only one gets to go through it. Trolley number two is ahead of number five, but I can change that with the pull of a lever, and you all know my policy on pulling levers. I haven't made it this far since my first ride. The bastard likes to get the newbie's hopes up, that's for sure, Gregory said. If I don't see you again, Desiree, remember to never miss a trolley, I stressed to her. I know that dying over and over again is hell, but wait waits for you on those platforms isn't any better. She looked at me with horrified, tear-filled eyes, and we all just waited for the sound of the lever being pulled that would signal our end. But it never came. Trolley number two stayed in the lead and crashed into the boulders, clearing them from the tracks before toppling off itself. We rode right by it, disappearing into the blackness of the tunnel before us. What? The woman at the back of the bus croaked. The first thing I had ever heard her say. And we have a winner. The conductor proclaimed. Though, I think we're all still more incredulous than relieved at making it to the end. I know I said that I always pulled the lever, but today the head of the ethics committee wanted to ride to the end. Remember, passengers, the true answer to any trolley problem you may face is whatever the boss says it is. Desiree understandably looked at me and Gregory with suspicion, but we both knew that neither of us could have been the one behind the trolley system. Technically, I suppose it could have been Desiree, or even the woman in the back, but Gregory and I didn't even entertain that thought for an instant. We both looked straight ahead to the person sitting in the front seat. The only person the conductor had ever listened to. The only person 
we had ever seen enjoy the trolley ride, and the only one of us who didn't seem surprised by what was happening now. Before we could decide how to react to this revelation, the trolley emerged from the tunnel at what looked like a train station in the real world. We're out, Gregory murmured. A tear rolled down his cheek. <laughs> We're actually out. That's right, passengers, and thank you for riding the Gadonkin Express, the conductor said as the trolley slowed to a stop. You made a real contribution to the field of moral philosophy, and you should be very proud. While your phone plans may have lapsed, all your devices should be fully charged and capable of making emergency calls. Any changes to the timeline you may notice are most likely the result of me killing Heinrich Himmler. Let's hope that was worth it. Please exit the trolley in an orderly fashion and have a pleasant evening. We hope you'll ride with us again someday. With that foreboding farewell, the trolley came to a full stop and the door slid open. The woman in the back immediately bolted through them, screaming and weeping as she ran across the platform. Gregory was next, followed by Desiree, neither wanting to miss their chance to escape. I was last, but as soon as I had one foot on the platform and one hand on the door, I paused. I looked at the front of the trolley, where Sarah was still sitting, still smiling. I felt rage boiling up inside of me. And as much as I wanted to get as far away from her as possible, some part of me demanded justice for everything I and every other passenger had been through. Why? I demanded, the word coming out as a barely intelligible guttural growl. It didn't matter to me then that she was a little girl, or it take in the form of a little girl. I wanted to smash her skull against the window until there was nothing recognizably human left. I like it when people die, she replied in the same innocent tone of voice she'd had the entire trolley ride. My sensors are much better than yours, so I experience the fear and pain of every death in every trolley in magnificent detail. And not just the trolleys. I have other playsets beside this one. But I don't like killing people, because then I can't play with them anymore. So I bring them back, good as new, and I get to watch them die all over again. I know it hurts you, but it makes me far happier. So everything's right in the end. I'm what philosophers, philosoph philosophers, I'm what philosophers call a utility monster. And that is my professional conclusion as the head of the ethics committee. And I'm still nice to people. Sometimes. My favorites get promoted from playthings to playmates and get to live forever with me. But the rest I usually just let go when they get too worn out from dying so much. It wouldn't be right to keep them after they stop making me happy. Catch and release, you could say. I've watched you die enough now, so you can go free. Honest. Thank you for making me so happy. Well, aren't you a darling? I hissed under my breath, seething as my desperate need for freedom and safety clashed with my apoplectic desire for revenge. And then she laughed. She just started laughing as if I had inadvertently made some hilarious joke or pun, and it was the sound of that laughter that finally made me run. It invoked some kind of primordial fear in me, and I knew there was no sense in attacking her. Her small form was brimming with otherworldly and unholy powers and there was nothing I could do to oppose her. So I ran. I ran out of that trolley and back into the world I belong in, never to set foot in a train station again for as long as I live.
I hope you enjoyed Trolley Problems, as written by the Vespers Bell and performed by Nick Goroff, Steve Gray, Alicia Pavlis, Olivia Steele, and Jeff Sturdivant. Now to the shows. Longtime resident and powerhouse Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. On that note, be sure to check out the other shows we offer on our network. We have Fear from the Heartland, featuring horror stories brought to you from the Heartland, airing Wednesdays. Eric Peabody's Horror Hill is a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you'll check him out. Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go... I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us, please, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.